Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat, which is the second in a three-part series about proposal preparation. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. Today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now and will also translate your written comments and questions in the chat. And soon we'll switch to uh, simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. And with that, I will turn it over to Nicole Young to give us a quick overview of CORE. Thanks, Nicole. So CORE Investments, uh, many of you might know, stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it as both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that um, advances uh, health and well-being across our whole community and really is aiming to be responsive to community needs. And CORE has evolved uh, over many years and through a very collaborative um, collective effort, um, this mission and vision statement were developed several years ago that really described the purpose of CORE, what it is that we're all working towards together. So we wanna be inspiring and igniting collective action to ensure Santa Cruz County is a safe, healthy community with equitable opportunities for all to thrive. And that when, if we are successful in doing that, we'll achieve this vision of our county being an equitable, thriving, resilient community where everyone shares the responsibility for ensuring the health and well-being of all people at every stage of life. And when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, and that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other uh, ways that people identify themselves. And so again, as both a funding model and a movement, CORE provides a framework to align priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide goals, and then work together to create the core conditions for health and well-being. And you'll see the equity is at the center of pretty much everything we do. That's that graphic that was on the previous slide and here in the core conditions. We put it there as a reminder to all of us that we have to examine and address our individual, our organizational, and our systemic beliefs and practices and structures that are often the very things that perpetuate the inequities that we are trying to eliminate. And events like today's uh, workshop and other core coffee chats are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. So think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of the Core Investments Initiative. And so through the Core Institute, we offer an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people across all different sectors, both nonprofits, public agencies, grassroots, community groups, uh, education agencies. And we're really trying to bring people together and create the opportunities and the space to build knowledge, skills, and systems that are needed to fulfill the collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. So in our time together today, we're gonna to share some ideas about how to prepare for grant proposals, no matter what the proposal is or who the funder is. Or um, And so for some of you, this might feel really timely. You might be actively working on some proposals. And for others of you, this might just be a good time to get ready and think about what you might um, start planning for or discussing with others so that when the next funding opportunity comes up that you feel you have some tools and skills to draw from. 
Um, feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat along the way. We will have some time later in the session to do some practice and, and also answer some questions. And we'll share links to the recordings, both in English and Spanish, as well as these slides um, after today's event. We need to uh, go through some steps to make sure everything is um, ADA accessible. And so it usually takes us a little while. But I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole Lesson, who's got some great content to share with us. Thanks, Nicole. So if you were able to attend or view our last session about preparing pr for proposals ahead of time, we talked, as Nicole mentioned, about some elements of your program and your pitch that can be updated at regular intervals so that you can feel and be more prepared for any opportunity that comes up. We'll have a chance to talk about two of those, theories of change and logic models, in a little more depth today, and we'll also be offering some training and technical assistance on these later this summer that will go into much more depth as well. And theories of change and logic models are just ways of clarifying what you're proposing to do and why. We'll also talk about some other ways to make your case, including the concept of framing, as well as how to balance data and stories to convey what's most compelling about your program to a variety of audiences. So let's start with a theory of change. What is it? How many of you already have one in place or have are playing with some version of a theory of change? Raise your hand or throw something in the chat. Tracy, you just updated yours. That's great. Anybody else? Well, hopefully this will inspire you to at least think about that um, and whether you end up just sharing it internally or, or do something that's more public facing or, or for funders, um, we hope that you'll find this a useful thing to explore. So there are lots of ways to organize and depict a theory of change with visuals. Um, we're following some steps that are really nicely laid out in guidance from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Gisela will put a link in the chat to a four-part set of guidelines that you can explore and download at your leisure. So this is just an overview of some of that content, which itself reflects lots of other um, approaches to, to uh, developing theories of change. But the main thing to remember is that theories of change operate at a couple of different levels. They're a conceptual model that shows why and how you expect some type of change or impact to happen. At the same time, because you're articulating those assumptions and why you think change will happen, usually in some kind of streamlined format, like a one page visual or chart, they're also a very concrete product that you can have after those discussions and explorations. When they're most effective, they clarify your assumptions about what you wanna change, why you're doing what you're doing, and how you plan to do it. They can help audiences see the relationship between your work and some underlying root causes, such as poverty or structural racism. They're also really useful because you can test your assumptions along the way. Maybe you're fine tuning your theory of change as you make progress in whatever you're trying to accomplish or conditions change. You're facing a different environment and so you're adjusting to that. They're also really great for um, incorporating and inviting a lot of different perspectives as you test your assumptions. As you know, sometimes the assumptions you have about your own program may not be as widely shared as you think, even within your own organization, let alone outside of it. So whether you're starting from scratch or updating a previous theory of change, this slide shows some good basic questions to jumpstart your process. So first you wanna ask yourself, what actions are to be undertaken? So what, what are you actually doing or planning to do? And then you wanna ask, 
what will happen as a result of those actions? What, what will those actions make possible? Are there forces outside the organization that help or could help, such as policy and system changes? Um, these may or may not be in your direct sphere of influence as an organization, but they're important to keep in mind and monitor because maybe you working with others could influence them. So um, Julie, I, I noticed no question about where does the collective action come in? That's one of the places. And if your program is successful, perhaps by joining forces with others, what changes or new conditions are expected to occur as a result of your actions? And who benefits from those actions or changes? What's actually going to be different for them? So a theory of change just helps us be really explicit about some of the assumptions behind these. And as you pose these questions internally and with your partners, you'll be trying to clarify whatever your goals and assumptions might be, identify the very specific strategies and activities that you're pursuing or plan to pursue, maybe with additional funding or partnerships or both, and linking those strategies to some longer term outcomes and goals. And finally, you'll be using this to reflect on what you come up with, making sure that it aligns with reality as well as other perspectives, and then communicating that to others. So all of these are benefits of taking the time to uh, articulate your theory of change. And there are some examples in um, those Annie E. Casey materials that are much easier to see and read as a PDF than in a slide. Um, so that's why we encourage you to look at those there to get some ideas if, if you're um, looking for some ideas. And don't be afraid to be creative. Um, you can create a perfectly fine theory of change, and we've certainly tried to do that in our work with text boxes and arrows and just plain old words. But if you happen to be or have access to a talented graphic designer or somebody who thinks visually among your colleagues or in your network, that can make a huge difference for this particular thing. So think about that as well. All right, let's talk a little bit about logic models, which are similar but distinct. So logic models um, cover some of the same terrain, but they're more linear, as you can see here. The most common components are to have some sense of the inputs, or in other words, the assets or resources that are in place or are needed for your work the activities that you're undertaking right now. So what's what are you already doing? The outputs or immediate results of those activities. So those are things that you can count or point to, like a number of counseling sessions or the people that you've trained or reached in some way. And then the outcomes that you hope will come from those activities, as well as the ultimate impact that you hope to achieve. And just a that that outcomes arrow could actually be split into some other parts, like you could have short-term outcomes that you expect to happen in the next couple of years and medium-term outcomes in some slightly longer time frame, like three to five years. And typically with a logic model, you would be have, uh, articulating some metrics or indicators that tell you and others um, that your projected outcomes are being achieved, either in whole or in part. And you can start a logic model at either end. So um, you could start on the left side about what we have in place and what we're trying to do. And that's closest to the current moment in time. Or you could start on the right-hand side. That's the much further down the road, ultimate impact side. And that could be years or even a decade away. Ideally, if you've done your logic model um, in, a, in a way that's compelling to others, it will make sense in either direction, from the left to the right, reading from the right to the left. And sometimes it's just a good exercise um, to work it both ways and see whether any 
thing changes on either end as a result of that review. So for example, maybe your ultimate impact could become more realistic based on that, or your current activities could become more ambitious when you realize that they might not be getting you to that impact that you want. And just like theories of change, logic models are a great way to help you test some assumptions about what you're doing, where you think you're going, and what signals you'll get along the way that you're making the progress that you intended to make. They're not supposed to be crystal balls that predict the future. Rather, they're your best informed guess about what you think will happen. That's why it's a good idea to update them along the way and respond to anything that's changed. And if you're, for example, if your outcomes or your outputs are not lining up with what you expected, that's a great time to be asking questions about why did that happen? How do we adjust our assumptions or our activities? And that's also um, something that's relevant to whatever you decide to evaluate about your program. This can really point the way to those metrics about what you're trying to achieve and how can really help you decide what you wanna track and what's realistic to track. So we hope that gives you an idea about how these two tools, theories of change and logic models, can help you make your case for your work. You can see that um, they both help you articulate the change that you think is needed in the world and exactly how you and your organization will contribute to making that change happen. And there's overlap between the two, for sure. Ideally, if you have both of these, they'll align with each other. But there are a few differences. Theories of change tend to be more explicit about the assumptions that are underlying what you're doing. Both can describe the activities, strategies, goals, and ultimate impact, but logic models typically have a bit more detail about these, as well as some metrics. And just a note that all of these words, activities, strategies, goals, objectives, outcomes, and impact may be defined slightly differently by different funders or agencies. If that's the case, you might want to offer an explanation in your proposal. For example, the XYZ Foundation or agency defines a goal this way, but here at our organization, we think of it more like this. So that's what's reflected in our materials. So that's just a judgment call about how far apart you might be from how a funder defines things. If you've put a lot of effort into developing these materials, um, it's probably good to try to explain how yours aligns with theirs. But if you're just starting out something or you're developing something specifically for a proposal, you might wanna consider adopting the funders language and definitions as well, um, because there are just some, some slight differences in those. Okay, let's turn to um, another good concept to think about when we're making our case, and that is the concept of framing. We're gonna um, talk a little bit about this, and I just wanna mention that like all of these resources, we're just scratching the surface in our brief time together this morning, but there is a lot out there um, and on framing the Frameworks Institute that Gisela is gonna put in the chat, um, has a link to all kinds of resources, including some very succinct, helpful, short videos, a lot of printed materials, case studies, and examples. But we hope this will whet your appetite um, for exploring that if, you, if you're not familiar with it already. So what is framing? The concept of framing is based on a lot of social science research about how people process information. The short version is that we're all flooded with so much information that we can't process all of it piece by piece. So we as individuals use frames to sort what we're going to pay attention to and respond to. Communications that ignore these frames, which are often based on values and emotions, are not gonna be as effective as communications that do pay attention to frames. In the language of framing, 
Communications that ignore emotions and values will bounce off the shield that we all use to protect ourselves from information overload, discomfort, or other struggles with processing what we hear and see and learn. So framing is just a way to use this insight and make more informed choices about what we say, how we say it, what we emphasize, and what we leave unsaid. I should point out that it's explicitly not about manipulating choices the way that advertising does. It's more about reframing or shaping how people think, feel, and act so that we can have a better chance of achieving our social change goals. One of many reframing examples that you'll find on the Frameworks Institute website is how we talk about youth. So they have an example about the, the language um, in, in the report that you see on the right-hand corner here, connections and communities, reframing how we talk about opportunity youth. Opportunity youth is a term that the Frameworks Institute has developed to um, talk about the, what's often um, pathologized as a lost generation um, post-COVID with youth in crisis. And based on their research, they think that there might be some opportunities to uh, talk about what we used to call at-risk youth in a different way with this terminology about opportunity youth. It's not just a search and replace uh, word for word swap though. They want us to think about a context around this terminology and use other words and images as well, such as plugging youth into resources and relationships in communities that benefit all youth and stop some of the othering that happens when we talk about at-risk youth. There's lots and lots more detail in the report that we don't have time to get into today, but if you work in this space um, or even are just interested in an example of framing, we encourage you to go to the Frameworks Institute website and look at this report, which was just released last month. So it's very current um, and it's, it's just a great example of how this idea can be applied, that, that words and concepts matter and how we frame the information that we're trying to get across can really um, increase the chances of it getting traction with different audiences. So this is another example of framing in action. It comes from an affordable housing coalition in Portland, Oregon from a few years ago. As you can see from this quote, like many of us, this group's default mode was to focus on the problem or need almost to the exclusion of any mention of solutions or how it could be consistent with people's shared values. So as the quote says, if, if we had five minutes to talk to people, we'd spend four and a half of them talking about how serious the need was instead of the other way around. So I'm thinking this might look very familiar to many of you. It's how we were all trained to do this, but here's the before shot, before framing from this coalition. Affordable housing is affordable to people earning less than 80% of the median family income so that they're not spending more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. This is a true statement. There's nothing wrong with this fact. There's nothing wrong with the sentiment behind it, but it's just not going to hit people the same way as the after statement, which is much simpler, same ideas, but more relatable. So I'll go back to the before. Whoops, sorry. How many of you have written something like that in a proposal? There's no shame in it. We've all been trained over and over to, to write this way, to present information this way. Yeah, thanks, Elaine but we, we hope we can persuade you that there are some other ways to do this. 
And so I just going to focus on the second part of the quote, which is, we should have spent just one minute on the need and the rest of the time on why that need is important in terms of values, how it matches what people care about, and what action should occur because of the need. So it, again, it's not ignoring the need or pretending the need isn't there. It's just a matter of emphasis. So here's how it works. We do one brief sentence about the issue or the problem or what's wrong. But the bulk of our five sentences or our five minutes, if you prefer, are two sentences on why it matters. So that's the values part. And two sentences on what should be done about it or a solution. Shall we try that? Anybody want to give it a go? Nicole, I see a, a question in the chat from Tracy um, or a comment and a question. I appreciate the new framing, but are funders shifting their expectations around quantifying need? What a great question. Thanks, Tracy. The answer is some funders are. Um, we see a lot more questions about what strengths and assets do you bring to a situation? Um, what do you propose to do about it? So again, you, you of course have to follow what your funder is asking for, but it doesn't mean that you can't sneak some of this in there. And funders aren't the only people we're communicating with, right? We might have um, a pitch to donors, for example. Uh, we might have something where we're communicating with a media representative about a particular issue. We're trying to educate people about what's possible so that they're not throwing up their hands and saying, this is an, an impossible problem to solve, or there's no role for me or, the, or an organization. So absolutely, if your funder is giving you 500 words on the need and 100 words on the solution, um, you, you're going to have to adjust to that. But just think about this in terms of when you do have options and also how you do present that need. Um, that it's not just statistics and numbers, but incorporate something about values. But it's a great question. Any other questions before we try this? Or maybe if I can add, Nicole, uh that it's, um, I think like what I hear and what you're describing is it's not a matter of replacing the facts or the statistics completely, mm -hmm. um, but this is like reframing provides an opportunity to, to think about what you want to lead with, kind of set, you know, in a proposal, how you want to kind of set the stage or like what's that first thing that you might want to emphasize to catch the reader's attention, whether it's the actual funder themselves reading it or, you know, a, a panel of, of reviewers that are reviewing and rating a proposal, like what's that first impression that you want to make for them and kind of set the tone. And then you might back that up with your facts and your data, but you've already kind of helped uh, kind of created this path for, you know, for them to kind of read the facts through versus kind of starting with the facts. And oftentimes starting with the facts or, or primarily relying on or solely relying on data. Sometimes the data is just hard for different people to wrap their heads around if it's a lot of <laughs> numbers and percentages. So the reframing, like that example that you just showed, Nicole, just like makes it so uh, simple and uh, kind of like has that emotional hook to it as well and uh and relatable um but also sometimes the, and this is something we'll cover more in some of our trainings uh later this summer also sometimes when we kind of rely solely or predominantly on the data we, we can go down this path of uh, almost conveying it as though it's um, the individual's fault, or it's the people, you know, the people that got themselves in that situation, or they just need to make better choices, or and so it kind of it lends itself, to, or you know, the, it can lead to that slippery slope of um, it's the people that need to be fixed versus the system 
uh, that needs to be. So it's kind of thinking about like what what is that other piece of them that that might tie back to your theory of change in terms of root causes about what it is that you're trying to address through your approaches through your programs. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great way to put it, Nicole. Just that you're not you're not letting go of the um, entirely of the the problem or need or even numbers about it, but it's just that the emphasis and what you want the the person who's listening to or reading this to walk away with, which is, I care about this. It's important to me, even if I don't experience that problem or need, and there's something that can be done about it. And this organization's doing it, so I'm going to support them. Are we ready to give it a whirl? Um, we're going to take just about five minutes to try this. So obviously, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just a chance to try this out and see how it might work for you. And just remember this ratio. Instead of most of your statement focused on the problem or need, just make that one of your five sentences and then try a couple sentences about why it matters. That's the values part. And a couple more on what should or could be done about it. That's the solutions part. Just see what it feels like. Um, it might feel very natural and it might just flow immediately for you, or it might take a little more work. Um, but just let's take a few minutes. And then if anybody is brave enough to share, uh, we would love to see what you came up with. And again, no shame at all. We've all been trained um, over years to do the exact opposite of this. Um, and Nicole and I have to catch ourselves often um, trying to uh, reframe the, the kind of instinct to, to lead with problems and, and needs. But let's, uh, let's see what we can do. It's just an interesting thought experiment to try it a different way if you haven't done this before. So I'll put a little music on. We're here to listen and help. And I'm gonna do a five minute timer and good luck. Okay, Gabriella, thanks for kicking us off. We had about one minute per sentence and you made the most of it. Do you wanna talk a little bit about your statement and how sure. that helped you to put that together and thanks thanks so much for sharing it. Um absolutely. Yeah, you know, so often and I really appreciate just like housing, um uh, very often the framing within my work ends up um yeah, talking about youth in a certain way or um talking about the children as um having inadequate adults in their life already, which is not true. They have amazing parent guardians that are acting on their behalf. And so I really, really appreciated the opportunity to, yeah, reframe in that first sentence. And the biggest thing that we talk about, uh, especially here in California with Big Brothers Big Sisters is mental health challenges. Um, so that was where I went with my first sentence, then reinforcing the values, like you had said, so values of, commitment, compassion, and then mentorship itself, right? Within our context, the commitment is of at least one year to the mentorship program. So it represents what I usually would have put a quantitative value on mm -hmm. unnecessarily. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and then it comes back to, yeah, how, how we really are that solution. I probably could hone this a bit more just based on the uniqueness of Big Brothers Big Sisters training and our youth protection stuff, but um but yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. That's just great. Um, Please give so edits if you see any. <laughs> and Gabrielle, would you mind actually reading it out loud so that we, so that if someone's watching this recording later, they can actually hear what sure. you wrote because it's fantastic. Sure. In Santa Cruz County, many children face mental health challenges without adequate support systems. At Big Brothers Big Sisters, we uphold the values of commitment and compassion, recognizing the transformative power of mentorship in their lives. Through fostering meaningful relationships, we provide the necessary support to navigate life's hurdles, addressing social isolation, and instilling confidence and resilience in the youth we serve. By connecting children with caring adult mentors, we empower them to overcome obstacles and build a brighter future. 
Well, just speaking for myself, I, I feel like I have a very different understanding of big brothers and big sisters from that statement. That's I mean, I, so wonderful. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I know the outlines of what you do and I believe in it, of course, but I just think that's a much broader um, statement that is much more, as you say, much more um, focused on on strengths and resilience and it doesn't ignore the needs and the problems, but it just, yeah. it's just much more solutions focused and much more um, broadly relatable. So. Thank you and for the challenge. Other. And I really, the structure really helped a lot. Thank you for that. Yeah, we, <laughs> we agree. Structure is, is our friend, especially starting something new and then you can riff on it in other ways. So Julie, I see that you also had a productive five minutes. Would you like to um, maybe read yours and and share what that felt like to you? Sure. Um, I don't know if it's as, as beautiful as Gabriella's. <laughs> okay, every person deserves a safe place to live. Issues of homelessness are being addressed in our county with the focus being on connecting unhoused people to housing. It's rare to hear prevention as part of the strategies to address this devastating issue. The Eviction Defense Collaborative made up of Community Bridges, Tenant Sanctuary, Senior Legal and Conflict Resolution Center supports families from falling into homelessness. This program needs to be renewed. People should not need to be homeless before receiving support from the county. Thanks, Julia. So was that different from from other ways you formulated that for you? Well, this we're just now dealing with this program not being funded, so I'm kind of just trying to figure out how to save it before it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I like this. I like this framework, and it makes a lot of sense. You know, people, a bunch of data doesn't really get to people's hearts. Unfortunately, that's often the case, yeah. But I, I can see um, just some of the language in here about focusing on, on prevention and that people shouldn't have to be in an acute um, crisis before getting help. So there are a lot of great concepts in here and just encourage you to keep working with us. Thanks for sharing it and for trying trying this exercise yeah um, both both examples are pretty impressive for <laughs> five minutes yeah, of of really practice impressive. and and you know again maybe we can just emphasize that like those are um both great like openings right in terms of kind of setting the tone for what people what you want people to pay attention to when they read this and kind of what frame of mind or mindset they'll be hopefully having as they're reading. And then you can always back that up with the data, right? Then you can, you know, to, to show that there are some concrete reasons for knowing that this is a need, but that's, it just has a different feel to it when you use that data as your, here's, here's how I'm backing up my statements versus like, oh, these poor people in need and we've got to save them. And, you know, so that's really what we're trying to get is like, how do you reframe that kind of message and tone? And I think both of these are great examples of that. Well, I wish we could hear more of them. And if you want to share them with us, we're, we're happy to um, look at them in the chat or, but I also wanted to open up um, if there are other questions that people have, um, other challenges you've faced in trying to make your case anything that we can talk through together in the in the few minutes we have left. And if there's something you're going to try, maybe besides this, um, maybe you're gonna go look at a, a frameworks document or give a theory of change or a logic model a try. Um, we'd love to know that as well. But any questions or, or challenges you wanna discuss with the group, we've got a few minutes for that. Can we, um, if we're gonna have a dialogue, can we take down the screen sharing?
Yep. Thank you. So, thank you for this information this morning. I, I, I already have a lot of notes and I'm gonna listen to the recording again. Um, but how do you, how does one, I, I, I like the information that we just got here, but how do, you know, when, when, when push comes to shove, when you're sitting down and you write in these grants, there's this, like, this level, high level of anxiety, right? Um, you know, it, it which I, I don't know, it shouldn't be that way. But, you know, that sometimes you're sitting in that high level of anxiety, then you end up writing from that place, right? Because you're really trying to state your case. And how do you move from trying to convince someone that, that the work that you're doing is incredibly important to just sitting in that place of knowing and just, just how do you express that without the panic, without the have to convince you to um to align with this work because I, I think about it like when you take the california bar exam the, the bar graders are just people right and they can grade your exams any time of the day or night and whatever and you know some people you know most of them have jobs and so they can be grading your papers at midnight so do you want somebody to grade your paper at midnight? Not really, right? Because they're tired. And I feel like that with the same thing with these grants. It's like, who's going to read them, and 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 what? I think y'all know what I'm trying to say, right? It's just so much anxiety leading up to it, in it, after it, and it's like you spend so much time sitting in that, and that's not productive. It's so true. It's, it's, it's not an ideal process. It's um, for, as you've pointed out, for reviewers or applicants often. Um, there's, there's a part of it that's volume and bandwidth. But really what you're making the case for is why we're doing these proposal prep sessions, thinking that there may be some things, not that everybody has downtime they're trying to fill, but there may be some things like logic models, theory, theories of change, reframing that lend themselves to multiple uses. Um, so maybe we maybe it's worth spending an afternoon, a staff meeting, a retreat, a board meeting on noodling through some of these things so that when that opportunity drops and it has a three week or a four week deadline or maybe a little longer, maybe a little shorter by the time you learn about it, that you can avoid at least some of the edges of that anxiety and panic and say, wait a minute, we've got this. We may have to adjust our language and our model to what this funder is requesting, but the concepts, we've, we've thought this through. We know what we're about. We know how to talk about it. We know how to make the case for what we're doing. And maybe, you know, maybe the adjustments that you're making are for a smaller grant or a larger grant versus a, oh my gosh, what are we going to say to respond? So I know it's really a big ask to say, have all this stuff ready to go. But I do want to make the case that these have multiple purposes, not just grants. We're, we're focused on proposals right now, um, but these are great for strategic planning. They're great for uh, recruiting and hiring. They're great for um, staff retreats and cohesion and morale. They're, you know, we're all pulling in the same direction. They're great for partnership pitches. Here's how we think we could work together and link arms on this. So um, please don't think of these as just a one-off that you you know, of course, they're helpful for this particular um, difficult task of um, seeking funding, and that might be the most urgent use of it for many of you. But we hope that you, if you spend the time to do these, that they have multiple uses, including reducing anxiety and panic um, and, and everything that flows from that. So, we, you know, we can't solve everything, but hopefully these and, and and these are habits and practices that the first time you do it is going to be a lot more time consuming than the updates you do next year or the year after. Thank you. You're welcome. And and also I will say there's some people who really take to this. They're not 
necessarily on your leadership team. It's an opportunity for people throughout your organization to shine and contribute. So um, maybe, or a board member or volunteers. So there, there are other ways to engage people in this work and it can be a real contribution and an opportunity for, for different ways of thinking. Nicole, anything to add or others? Um, only that, um, and, and Nicole Lesson does a lot more grant writing than I do, but <laughs> every time there's always that anxiety, no matter like how mm -hmm. good or how many times something I wrote was funded, like each new profile, there's always that level of anxiety. And so I know for myself, what really helps is just having someone else to be a sounding board mm -hmm. with, to like, give me that reassurance that no, no you're on the right track. This isn't something totally new or different than what you know. And so it's like, it just gives me that confidence. And so again, Nicole Lezen is often that person for me um, to just give me that confidence, like, okay, I know what I'm talking about. And so like, it just helps me be more confident in like not wavering on what I'm trying to say, even if it feels like I'm, um, cause sometimes proposals are an opportunity to kind of re-educate whoever the reader is, like the funder, the reviewers, the, you know, or if it's, you know, a um, donor campaign, right? It's an, op it's an opportunity to also, if you're introducing kind of new ways of saying things or new terms or like opportunity youth versus at-risk youth, like then it's an opportunity to educate people about what that means and, and why that's important. And so, um, Kind of like the more you do it, the more confident you become in it. If you uh, have quotes from other people too, in terms of what these opportunities have resulted in, it's, you know, oftentimes people really um, respond. Some people really respond to the quantitative data and really like to see the numbers. And some people really respond to the qualitative quotes, stories. So like whatever kind of combination of things that you uh have available and feel it'd be effective for any given proposal to again kind of back up your your statements or the case that you're trying to make um so it feels less like it's just me and my opinion that I'm putting out here it's like no no no. this is like I'm representing you know a community mindset uh you know a collaborative mindset and I would also add that you can do the greatest job ever putting a proposal together and as you've said, Elaine, somebody's reading it at midnight or has had a bad day or you miss something. It's really hard not to take it personally. or <laughs> You put a lot of effort into it. There's a lot riding on it. But most proposals are competitive. There's not enough funding to fund every good idea, every great organization, every need. And so you just have to accept that they're not all going to be successful. And what you're trying to do is increase your chances of success and also increase the, the content that you can use in other ways um, so that it doesn't feel wasted. Or um, So I, I think these kinds of tools are, are that. They're, they're useful for multiple purposes, but they also... Um, if you use them in a grant and they're not successful, you can get feedback on what happened. You can um, adjust them for next time, but you'll have a start. You'll have a much stronger starting place, even if they're not successful initially, which unfortunately is just going to happen sometimes. It happens to all of us. Thank you for that, Nicole and Nicole. <laughs> it's good to see you both. <laughs> um, we will hang out for a few minutes after the official end to see if there are more questions that we can help with, but we also wanted to share some resources with you um, or just a reminder of some things that we've covered. Um, so the Annie E. Casey Foundation is the place to look for everything about theories of change. There, It's a four-part uh, set of PDFs with lots and lots of guidance. Frameworks Institute, everything about framing. Um, there, it's searchable by topic area. So if you're working with youth or in housing or early childhood, um, public health, there are lots of um, resources specific to your issue on the Frameworks Institute website. Really 
a productive uh, place to search. And we didn't get into the um, Colorado Equity Compass. This is a set of resources, the Equity Data Navigator, that really impressed us. Um, it's available in English and Spanish. It's Colorado specific, a lot of the content, but it gives you some great ways to talk about, to weave um, equity into your stories and data presentations, how to balance the two. Um, if It's another way to just um, get started if you're stuck or, or restarted as the case may be. Um, Nicole, do you wanna? Yeah, so um, this was the second of a three-part series on proposal preparation. So we did kind of um, are thinking about or approaching proposals as a project and kind of all the ways that you can plan ahead for that. This today was about framing and making your case. And then our next session will be on the magic of metrics. And so it's a good complement to the theory of change and logic model piece that Nicole described today. Um, so we'll have another opportunity like this on May 2nd to do a, a similar type of format. And then we also have on the next slide some other opportunities for, and we're calling them peer learning circles because they are less structured than these workshops like what we did today. There'll be a little bit of content and resources provided, but a lot of it is really about bring your questions. Uh, and, and we're focusing on program evaluation in particular. So if you're trying to think about how do we, you know, what are we measuring and what are we trying to evaluate? How do we go about doing that? Um, there are three sessions, three peer learning circles that have been scheduled, April 17th, May 8th, and May 23rd. Each one has a different theme, starting with key components of an evaluation plan, then data collection analysis, then getting the most from your data and findings. Um, themes just to kind of uh, provide a little bit of a container to the discussions, but really uh, we, we encourage you to, to to attend with your questions, bring your colleagues, your coworkers, anyone that is involved in evaluating or trying to figure out how to evaluate your programs and services. Two of our colleagues on the core consulting team, Jane Conklin and Crystal Caballero, will be the ones hosting and facilitating these peer learning circles. Um, Jane is an evaluate, evaluation whiz. That is uh, one of her great loves and areas of expertise. So she will be a wealth of information and resources if this is an area that you are looking to um, learn more about and, and kind of fine tune and refine in your organization. So the um, links to the, the link to the events registration page on our core website is in the chat, as well as links to the feedback poll for today's session, or you can scan the QR codes that you see on the slide. We welcome all feedback about the content, the structure of today, things that you liked, things that could have been improved, things you'd like to see offered in the future. So if there are additional topics that you'd like to see us offer through the Core Institute, we're happy to uh, take those into consideration. I just wanna thank everyone for being here and for um, sharing your examples and not sure if they're both still here, but Gabriela and um, Julia both gave us permission to actually uh, copy their examples and get them translated and, and insert them into the slides that we'll send out afterwards as part of the, the follow-up materials. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you both. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Take care. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.